Our Catholic friends, they don't know. And I'm talking about, they don't even teach in their doctrine that they can know for sure they're going to heaven, to glory. What did I do? Unplug the wrong deal? They don't, they don't know in their religion. They, can't, they don't teach it in their doctrine. They can't because that's how they hold power over everybody. If you're Jehovah's Witness... And you say you want to you go to heaven. Well, they'll tell you more than likely you can't because you're not part of the 144,000. But you can enjoy eternity on earth. However, have you knocked enough doors? Have you uh, converted enough people? Have you done enough? How much is enough? Can't define it. So in their religion, they can't even teach that you can know for sure. Same in the Mormon religion. Your salvation is contingent upon your marriage. And if your marriage, you know what the divorce rate is in uh, Idaho, uh, not, not Utah? It's higher Last time I heard, it's been a while, but higher than any other state in the Union, divorce rate. And you would think, well, that Mormons are everywhere. They believe strong in marriage. Yeah, they do. They believe in it so strongly that if you don't, if your spouse or you whatever no longer believe in the Mormon religion, your wife or your husband dumps you immediately and you go find another one because you cannot have your own planet and produce your children to populate that planet. And that's their version of salvation. That's how when they say they're going to heaven, that means that they're going to a planet somewhere in the universe to populate it just like God did ours. Okay? So they, they don't have any assurance. Roman Catholics never have assurance. And that's by design. You can't control people who, are, who already know they're going to heaven. You can't control them. You hold it over their head for any reason whatsoever and tell them... Um, I, t I told John this this morning... A video popped up for me to watch, and I watched a uh, part of it. Didn't get to see all of it, but it was on the uh, the so-called miracle at Fatima, which I believe is in Spain, I think. But that uh, allegedly three well, not allegedly they did three children shep shepherd children saw Mary appear to them on at least six or seven different occasions, gave them all things to do. Um, the brother of the three children, the two had two girls and one boy, the brother, when they started having the appearances of Mary telling them things, it changed his behavior to where he didn't, he didn't really want to pray with his sisters a lot. He liked to be alone to pray. And the document, and this was put out by the Catholic Church, their television network, EWTN, that he used to go to a chapel there by his village where they had um, a, a monument in the church called the Hidden Christ. And Christ is hidden inside there because Christ is sad because nobody stops sinning. He's sad. He's so sad that everybody keeps sinning and he wants everybody to stop sinning and nobody does. So he just gets sadder and sadder. And I'm not kidding you. They said this in the document. The boy would go to that chapel to console Christ, to make him feel better about all these people who keep sinning. 
so that he wouldn't be so sad. And when I heard that, I immediately heard, remembered a verse. I, it took me a little while to figure out, remember where it was. It was Isaiah 40, it was in Romans. And the verse basically says concerning God, who is God's counselor? Who is it that can tell the Spirit of God what to do and where to go and who to move and how to move? Who is it that does that? No man on this earth, especially no little kid. But then, on the, there was a final appearance and over 70,000 people gathered in this family's field that they used for growing their food. 70,000 people gathered because the children said on this certain day at noon, she's going to appear to everybody. Well, 70,000 people came from miles, different, different countries. Newspaper reporters came. This is all in the early 1900s, around 1917, somewhere around in there, 1918. And... Mary appeared to the three children, but the people there didn't see Mary. But what they did see was a heavenly light show like you would not believe. And this is verified. This, is, this actually happened. There were orbs flying all around the sky. And they, were all, they were all looked like the sun. And so you had these multiple suns all flying around up in the sky and 70,000 people are seeing this and they got their miracle. So Mary told one of the girls, number one, I want you to build me, listen to her, listen to Mary. She said, I want you to build me a, um, some kind of worship place, a shrine in this field right here. And then... I am the queen of the rosary, or the mother of the rosary. And you must, I want you to say the rosary every day. Because God is so angry at every one of you because you won't stop sinning. He is angry with you every day, and his anger is getting worse every day, and if you will start praying the rosary every day, it will reduce God's anger. I am not making that up. I thought God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's what I, I, I thought I read that somewhere. I think that might have been the first verse I ever memorized. But uh, that just... They'll never, to tell, remember what Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, bring you any other gospel. So here is Mary, and she's not telling them, call upon Jesus, trust in his salvation, trust in the cross and the blood of Jesus. She didn't tell them that. She said, if you pray the rosary every day, God will be less angry with you. She changed the gospel. She brought a different gospel. And so Fatima is, is, a cur is cursed ground. And all of those, there was a commentator on this documentary who referred, the title, his title was Fatima Theologian. In other words, he spends his whole life studying the theology related to the event that happened at Fatima. Spends his whole life there. And there are others like him. Padre Pio was a man who had what's called the stigmata. The, he had sores in his hands and in his feet uh, almost constantly throughout his, the later part of his ministry. And basically people put him and he put himself on such a high pedestal that there is a Padre Pio theologian at the Padre Pio Catholic Church somewhere in Europe that said that Padre Pio said that I, he said, I have asked God that when I die, I'm going to stand at the gates of heaven and those who have not followed my doctrine and 
my life and believed in my miracles, I'm not going to let them into heaven. That's what the man said. I think he's at the wrong gate. I think he's got the wrong, I think he's at the wrong gate. John uh, 14, we're going to get into 15 tonight. Uh, get your Bible open. We will read, you know, that's not, let's see here. Where's the rest of it? There we go. John 14. Um, we'll start reading at verse 23. Uh, no, 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 let's see here. We've dealt with that. We'll start, let's start verse 26. We'll read to the end of the chapter. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 26. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. So if you, are, if you want to make a note of something in your Bible, one of the chores of the Holy Ghost, one of the uh, things that the Holy Ghost does is he is there teaching you the Bible while you're reading it. If you, if you choose to believe the Bible, believe what it says, then the Holy Ghost will be there to enlighten you. you when they tell you that, uh, well, your problem, your, your problem with understanding the Bible is you're trying to understand a Bible written in a 400-year-old language that no one speaks anymore, which is not true. Um, in other words, get rid of your King James and upgrade, upgrade your software. What usually happens to your phone or your computer when they decide to upgrade your software? It don't work. Okay? They come out with an, with a, they come out with an immediate fix saying, we got that all wrong. So now take this. Trust us. We know what we're doing. But anyway, that's what, anyway, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall, in other words, you don't need a better translation. You don't need a newer translation. You just need the one you have. You don't need Greek. You don't need to learn Hebrew. I would, once you have, once you are confirmed in your heart that you have sucked dry everything that there is out of this English Bible, then I'd say you could go to the Greek one. Okay? It won't happen. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So in other words, you'll be in situations where the Holy Ghost will quote scripture to you in your mind and in your heart and you'll go whammo, that's what I needed. Verse 27, Please, uh, peace, I have, uh, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. He's telling them, be not, af be not afraid. How many times? Do a study one day if you just want to. Of the number of times God said it in the Old Testament or, one, or an Old Testament character said it. Or Christ said it in the New Testament. Fear not. Be not afraid. Okay, fear thou not. Joshua said it when he told the men to go stand on the necks of the five Philistine kings. And he said, fear not, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And he meant that. Christ in Matthew 24 is telling us all these things that we're going to see happening. He says, fear not, fear not, fear not. Same thing here. Fear not, I'm going to go away. You've heard me say it. I'm going to go away um, and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. In other words, I'm telling it to you now, and you hang on to it, and when it happens, and you've remembered that scripture, and you see now that scripture come to pass, you'll know that it, that it was me, and that I can predict the future, and I'm never wrong, 
ever. And when that happens, you'll have more faith in me. If you have already been in situations in your life where you've read things in the Bible, you've read portions of Scripture, you read a verse, and you question God, God, I don't see this happening in my life. God, I don't see this going on in my life. God, what is, why, why is this, I mean, you're telling me to believe you, and I want to believe you, but this is not happening. Why is it not happening? And uh, a lot of times God may just not say anything. He'll have you wait. But sure enough, one day, lo and behold, the very thing that you read in the scriptures that you ask God for happens. And the Holy Ghost then, you might, you might in prayer, crying and thanking God, God, why, why did you do this? God, this is amazing. How did you do this? Why did you do this? And then he'll call to your remembrance what you prayed, what you asked for, what you read in the scriptures, and just how, how it fulfilled every word that God said. I've, I've experienced that. I hope you have too, because I'm telling you, there's nothing like it. It's, it is what makes you want to keep going and not give up. And I'm say this to everybody. There will always... Come a time when the devil will say to you, give up, quit. It's not worth it. It's not working. You might as well walk away. I've been in this thing, this monkey business long enough to know that I have seen people that I knew had heard that voice. And they left. They did exactly what was said to them. You might as well give up. You might as well quit. Ain't worth it. Might as well just move on. Don't listen to it. Don't listen to it. Fight it off. Don't listen to it. The devil will try to talk you out of heaven just about every day. Don't let him do it. I, it was, I, well, I can't get him to stop. Resist. That's all you got to do is resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's a guarantee. So, um, verse 29 um, and now I have told you before it, now I've told you before it come to pass that when it has come to pass, you might believe verse 30 hereafter, I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Now I, I thought about that for a while and it's the only thing that I can, that I can see in this verse we know according to scripture that the plan of, of Christ to go to the cross, to then be buried in a, in a rich man's sepulcher, and then rise on the third day, that plan was already in progress, even at this time. It was already moving forward. Satan, the Bible says, if the princes of this world, Satan or he, and his top legion of devils, his principalities and powers and so on, if they would have figured out that by sending Jesus to the cross, that would be the wrong move, they wouldn't have done it. They wouldn't have, that's what, that's what Paul said. If they would have known that the crucifixion of Christ would have meant the salvation of the world and their defeat, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Would have never done it. Of course they wouldn't have done it. Okay? It's, it's think, think of a football game. If, if the defense, 
if one guy on the defense can actually hear the quarterback on the other team given the signs and he happens to know what those signs are, what's he going to do? He is going to arrange his defense in order to stop that offensive move. Okay? That's what he's going to do, and it's not going to work. And if you watch football games, American football, you, if you see coaches now speaking over their microphones or whatever, they will hide, their, they will cover their mouth with their game book so that their lips cannot be read because teams have done that before. They've had guys, professional lip readers, with telescopes looking at the coach, reading his lips, conveying that information to the defensive coordinator up in a thing somewhere. He's sending signals down to the field. The field's sending it out to the guys on the, who are on the field, and they align their defense according to that because they know what play's coming. Kansas City got caught in baseball. I think it was Kansas City. Years ago, uh, a guy would stand with binoculars and watch the catcher make his pitch signs to the pitcher. And they had a, they had a guy that had a, was hitting a trash can with a baseball bat and so many hits on that trash can told the batter what pitch was coming. So they were knowing what pitch was coming. They, they knew it was going to be a... Uh, a breaking ball, it means it's going to look like a strike and it's going to drop at the end. They're not going to swing at it and the umpire's going to call it a ball. They were cheating. So, if you think about it, most games played, baseball, football, hockey, uh, soccer, things like that, where they have plays designed and those plays have to be submitted to the field somehow, some way. There is always a certain amount of deception. Why do you have five men who are going to go running all the way down to the field to catch a ball that is never going to be thrown? It's to get six guys to run down the field with them while you short pass it to somebody down here. You have deceived that team. So Christ here, he says... I, hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh. Who is that? It's Satan. And hath nothing in me. He's not, he's not helping me in my kingdom. He has not, he's no part of this. So I'm not going to say much more. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tip my cards accidentally and let him read what I've got I'm not going to let him I love to see baseball managers do their signs okay and uh, I'm not I'm not going to let him know the, my signs I'm not going to let him know anything about what I'm going to do because if he figures it out he'll he'll stop he won't do it won't go through with it and it has to be it has to be this way what did Jesus pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? Lord, if there be any other way. But there was no other way. So Christ realized that night, this is how it's got to be. This is what I have to do. And there is no other way. So I'm not going to say much more. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to reveal it. Until afterwards. And then the only thing that maybe he might try to do after that, some 2,000 years later, is see if maybe he can alter time itself. And I think I believe that. In the book of Daniel, one of the comments made by the angel concerning the Antichrist in the last days is that he shall seek to change times and laws. And the Bible says right after that, and they will be given into his hand. We have already, in that machinery out there in Europe, that most of this world has no idea what it is and what it's doing. The large hadron 
Collider with the Higgs boson and the God particle and all that stuff that nobody in the world understands. One of the things that they, that they say that they have done is sent a particle through time. Now, it was only like one quadrillionth of a second, but they actually were able to send something through time. Okay? It's a small step, but when babies figure out how to make small steps, what do they do after that? That's one small step for man. Right? Uh, verse 31 but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Remember what Hebrews 10 says uh, concerning Christ. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. The Father gave him commandment in the volume of the book. He is going to do exactly what the book says. The Reverend Sung Myung Moon, who remembers the Mooney cult back in the 70s, 80s, Unification Church in Korea, South Korea, uh, was named after the Reverend Moon, who claimed to be a Christian minister, but him and, his, him and his wife then claimed that they were the God and goddess, and that Christ failed at the cross and was not able to perform what God said, so the Reverend Moon, God sent the Reverend Moon to this earth to finish what Jesus failed to do. That, that's a lie. Okay, uh, well, listen, Reverend Moon, we're already 2,000 years past that. We're, get over that one. Okay, that one's already been proven it was done. Okay, so he says, arise, let us go hence. In other words, this conversation is over. Now, chapter 15. Um, Jesus said, we'll read down to verse 9. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me. So I want you to understand this. And this, this is vital to help you understand how your life in Christ really works. Not the way the cults tell you. Not the way the Facebook people tell you. Shoot, I think there's more false doctrine floats around Facebook. Share, share this picture of Jesus 20 times with 20 friends you know, and God will bless you. And if you don't, you don't love God. Excuse me. What verse was that? That I have to share this thing with 20 people I know, and if I don't, I don't love God. And God will be mad at me. I don't like that kind of stuff. I don't. It, it irritates me. Um, I'm the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Remember the true vine. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So count up the number of church members. And I'm not saying Christians. I'm not saying born again people. I'm saying church members or church people. Take, take the number of church people that... Do not produce fruit and ask yourself, what is God then going to do with them that do not produce fruit? They're not going to heaven. They are not going to heaven. And let me tell you something. I, I grew up, and a lot of you know what I'm talking about, in an age in the church where a fruitful church was a church that was gaining more in membership every quarter. That was a fruitful church. They, they were showing that they were bearing, that, that they were producing fruit because they had teams going out, soul winning, bringing people in, a church was growing, and this and that and the other. And they said, that is the sign of a fruitful church. That has nothing to do with it. How many people you have in your church does not indicate whether or not those people are bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Are there churches bigger than Bethel Church? So let's say a church running 500 on Sunday morning. 
Are they better than us? Because obviously they have brought more people in than we did. Are they better than us? Does that the proof that they have produced the fruit of God because of that number being there? Generally, you can go, uh, well, this is not really true anymore. But there was a time when you could go to just about any town in southern Missouri, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Florida, whatever. You could go in any of those southern area churches. And if you went to First Baptist Church in that town, it would be the biggest church in that whole area. That's just how it was. The Southern Baptist Convention was and has been a very large denomination. And most First Baptist churches are Southern Baptist. But now when we look at the Southern Baptist Convention, when we look at Southern Baptist churches in general, do, are they displaying the real fruits of the Spirit? Or are they just adding more people to the list? And that, to them, is what it's always been about, is adding people to the membership list. Okay, I, I knew a church in this town, I won't say which one it was, but uh, every Sunday morning, the pastor would have a regular invitation, and then he would have an invitation to offer anyone to come for church membership. And um, I don't know exactly their process of it. I just know that that's what he did. I know that's what he did because they used to have a TV show on. Okay? In this town. Um, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Anybody know? Is it, more, is it more people in the pews? No. One of them is love. The other one is joy. Another one is peace. Another one is long suffering. There's one called gentleness. There's one called faith. One called meekness. One called temperance. What, what am I missing? Did I get all of them? Anyway, that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the evidence. Okay? The evidence that I have the Holy Spirit in me is not that I can get a lot of people into the church. One of, the, one of the evidences that the Holy Spirit abides in me is that I love God enough to sacrifice a part of me that stands in God's way of doing what He wants. And I am willing to have my right hand cut off and cast from me or my eye plucked out and that is because I love my God more than I love myself so there is a part in you that when times get rough when they get hard when tribulation ariseth when the devil starts trying to use sin and temptations to draw you out, you love God more than you love your sin. And if the Holy Ghost did not put that in you, you it wouldn't happen. Does that make sense to everybody? Is that simple enough to understand? Okay. Okay. Uh, Let's say in children, if your child 
does something that is hideous and horrible and it burns you up and you could just choke him to death or her. But you love that child more than anything in the world. That's putting them first, not you. Right? That's putting them first. Okay? What, what can we do to get your life on track? Okay? What can we do to get, get God moving and working in your life? Instead of casting them aside, throwing them out, get rid of them, okay? That may not be the best, but you get what I'm saying. That's what love does. And so each one of us should have something in us that just because something went bad and it was a terrible situation, you're not giving up on God. Because you love him. And you love him because he first loved you. And he's done so much for you that no matter what happens, you're not going to be separated from his love. Neither height, nor death, nor principality, nor things present, nor things to come can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's the fruit of the Spirit. So let's go back and look at this again. Verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, it may take a while, and there, Jesus actually has a teaching in here about a tree that the, la- the, the husbandman is ready to cut down. But John, the vineyard guy, former vineyard guy, says, Boss, you know... It just looks like it wants to put fruit out this year. Before you cut it down, give me one more year with this. I don't know why I want this vine to do something, but just give me one more year. I'm going to dig around it. I'm going to manure it well. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to give it whatever it needs. I want this thing to go. So at at the end of the year, after I've done everything I can, it still is not producing fruit, cut it down. It's it's your land. We'll put something in here that works. But just let me try one more time with this. That's patience. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit, isn't it? Patience. Huh? Long-suffering. So there's two of them right there. And that's just a plant. And God would say, are you not more important than plants? So long-suffering with people. So maybe you can ask yourself, well, then why are these churches still growing? Why are these churches, you know, they're buying billboards all over the town. They're putting campuses all over the place. They're shutting all the small churches down. Believe it or not, that is part of the plan of God not the will of God the plan of God because it then starts determining who's on the right side and who's not I like what sister Betty said Sunday I like this little church okay didn't didn't hurt my feelings a bit she said little okay um in, in this world, and I'm not painting everything with a broad brush, but in this world and in this country's culture right now, if you've got a huge church, more than likely there's a huge problem somewhere. If you're, if, if you're preaching this book the way we're told to preach it, you will not have 5,000 people in Sunday school won't happen but anyway that's the fruit of the spirit every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it are you hearing me okay is there something 
This is, this is what we'll do tonight. We're going to have prayer over this one. Number one, you're going to ask yourself, God, are you producing fruit in me? And, and understand this. I learned it. I've, I've taught it. But I want you to understand it. And I want you to relearn it and remember it. You are not supposed to to try to produce fruit. You're not. Producing fruit comes only by way of a blessing from God. And God blessed man and said, be fruitful and multiply. Is that not what God said? Is that not what God said to the birds of the field and the trees of the earth? And God blessed them and said, be fruitful. Being fruitful is a blessing that comes from God. It is never the works of man. Never. Fact is, if it's your work, it is not the fruit of the Spirit. And this relieved a lot of pressure off of me years ago. And what God used to help change me uh, way back then was that I had had it in my mind that it was my responsibility to make sure that every pew had a bunch of people sitting in it. And God chasing me over that several times and says, Mike, it's not your responsibility, it's mine. He did not call us to produce fruit. If you look at the scriptures, he calls us to bear it. Bear the fruit. And that's all, that's all we do. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians. I, Paul, plant the seed, Apollos watereth, but God bringeth the increase. God is the one who does that. So I'm going to ask you tonight a couple things. Number one, um, is God um, causing you in your life to bear fruit. Um, number two, do you feel like you are in danger of being sawed off the branch by God and cast into the fire? And understand that I'm speaking to more than just the people sitting here. I'm speaking to whoever God has listened to this on the other side of that. Are you, are you in fear that God is close to taking a pair of snips or a saw or whatever it is and cutting you off and casting you into the fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth? If there is, if I were you, I'd be praying tonight. God, please. Don't cut me off. God, please, bring forth fruit in my life. And then, number three, is there something in your life that as God sees you put out a few, when a, when a little branch first grows off of a vine shoot, its first year, does it put out like eight clusters of huge grapes? It, no, it doesn't. Why? Number one, it can't bear it. Yeah, it's not very strong, is it? Okay. But it did put out, it, it produced blossoms and leaves, and it did put out some little tiny little grapelets, okay, raisins. Preformed raisins, okay, that, that works, okay, that's fruit. Um, and then years later, yeah, it's got big grapes on it, okay. It just, it's part of God's plan. But when God sees that and he sees now they're, they're producing fruit, or bearing fruit, excuse me, there I said it. He says, okay, now I'm going to purge that. Because not every little twig on that little, on that little sub-branch 
did something. All it did was suck up water, suck up nutrients, suck up sunlight and air, and let every other branch bear the grapes. While it got a free ride. So God's going to go. He's going to purge it. So I want to ask you tonight. Is there anything in your life. That you really feel like God needs to purge. Out of your life. He said he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit.